Today's video is made possible by Brilliant.org. Today we're going to look at an interesting way of calculating higher derivatives without calculating lower derivatives. And we're going to start by finding the second derivative of a function without finding the first derivative of that function. And it's going to involve a somewhat of a limit definition for the second derivative. And so let's pretend that we don't yet know that this will give us the second derivative, but we'll define this operator d so that it takes a function f of x and gives us the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus 2h minus 2 f of x plus h plus f of x all over h squared that should be. And of course, that's only if this limit exists. If this limit doesn't exist, well then, as we'll see, this will not be second differentiable. So let's make sure that this does exactly what we want it to, and that is it creates the second derivative without actually taking the first derivative. Let's look at the power rule first. So something of the form x to the n. So if we do this operator on x to the n, what will we get? Well, we'll have the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus 2h to the nth power minus 2 times x plus h to the nth power and then plus x to the nth power. So we have something like this and then this is all over h squared. So how are we going to evaluate this? Well, I think it'll be useful to recall our binomial expansion formula for x plus something to the nth power. So let's recall that binomial expansion formula up here so that we can use it later. So we'll have x plus a to the nth power expands as the sum as k goes from 0 to n of n choose k, that binomial coefficient, and then x to the k, a to the n minus k. So we're using that in this case when a is 2h, in this case when a is equal to h. And in fact, we'll group the tail end of most of these expansions together. Okay, so let's start this expansion. We'll have the limit as h goes to zero. Now, as I expand this out, I'm gonna put this one over h squared term out front because I'm gonna need more than one line for this expansion. Let's in fact do it in three lines. One line for this x plus 2h to the n and another one for the next and then finally one for the x to the n. Okay, so we'll expand this x plus 2h to the n using our formula over there. That'll give us x to the n plus 2nh times x to the n minus 1 plus 4 times n times n minus 1 over 2 times h squared times x to the n minus 3. So that would be like n choose 3 or sorry, n choose two. And then we'll have a bunch of other terms and all of those other terms are all attached to an h cubed. So I'll just group them together into that box. Okay, now we're gonna subtract two times the expansion of this x plus h to the n. So that'll give us x to the n plus n times h times x to the n minus one plus n times n minus one over two times h squared times x to the n minus, that should be minus two up here as well and then plus h cubed times another group of stuff which is all connected to, like I said, the h cubed. And then finally we're adding an x to the n on which descends down from this term right here. And now let's color code this simplification. We have x to the n plus x to the n minus 2x to the n, so all of these cancel each other. So that's nice. Then next up, we've got 2nh x to the n minus one. And then we have negative 2nh x to the n minus one. So those will cancel each other as well. So we'll have this cancel this. Okay, great. Then we can see this four will get canceled by this two down to a two. And then we've got two times n times n minus one times h squared x to the n minus two minus one of them from that cancellation. So that's gonna leave us with one left over. And now I think we're ready to start writing out the next step. So this will be the limit 
h goes to zero of one over h squared, and then we'll have n times n minus one times h squared times x to the n minus two. Again, that's what is simplified out of that orange stuff up there. And then plus a bunch of stuff which is attached to h cubed. Okay, nice. But now we can see an obvious simplification. One over h squared will cancel this h squared, leaving us with simply n times n minus one times x to the n minus two. And then this one over h squared will cancel that down to an h, but we're taking the limit as h goes to zero. So all of this will tend off towards zero. But let's see, we've got dxn is equal to this object right here, which is pretty clearly the second derivative of x to the n. So in fact, this is a nice limit definition of that second derivative. Okay, let's do another example. Hang on there a second past me. I need to tell everyone about today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a website, sure, but their approach to learning is the star of the show. Brilliant's visual, hands-on approach can be your key to understanding the concepts behind today's technology, which is crucial to staying ahead. You can explore a variety of topics and skill levels, Brilliant will support you every step of the way. Gradually, you can master whole topics in as little as 15 minutes a day and learn anywhere, anytime on your phone, tablet, or computer. Brilliant makes learning more like a game with fun features that let you challenge yourself and compete with others. Recently, I've been teaching a Calculus 2 class, and I thought that I'd check out what Brilliant's calculus offerings look like. And was I ever impressed by what they have to offer? Great visuals, intuitive explanations, and they gamify learning. If you'd like to level up your math and STEM skills and experience the joy of learning, go to brilliant.org and treat yourself to a unique hands-on experience. A 30-day free trial and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. For our next example, we're gonna look at this operator on sine x. So here we'll have the limit as h goes to zero of, let's see, this will be sine of x plus two h minus two times the sine of x plus h and then plus the sine of x. Nice, and all of that is over h squared. So here we're gonna need to recall the sum angle formula for sine, but I'll use that during our calculation. So bringing this down, we have the limit as h goes to zero. Then again, I'll bring this one over h squared out just for simplification. Then we'll apply the sum angle formula for sine with this x plus two h. And that'll give us sine of x times cosine of two times h, plus sine of two times h times cosine of x. And then we'll apply this rule again with two sine of x plus h, so that'll be minus two times sine of x cosine of h minus two times sine of h times cosine of x, and then finally we add sine of x onto all of that. And now let's break this into parts based off of things that are connected to sine of x, like these three terms, and cosine of x, which are these two terms. So I'll take everything connected to sine of x first, and I'll bring that out because with respect to the limit, sine of x is a constant. So we have sine of x times the limit as h goes to zero of, let's see, we'll have cosine of two times h, and then after that we'll have minus two times cosine of h, and then finally plus the number one, and that is all occurring over h squared. Okay, so that's a good place to be. So we'll be applying some trig identities to finish this one off as well. So we'll take this cosine of two h, and we can rewrite that as cosine squared of h minus sine squared of h, like that. And then in turn, we can take this sine squared of h and write it as one minus cosine squared of h. So let's see what that does. Maybe let's put all of this calculation over here. So we have cosine of two h equals 
cos squared of h minus sine squared of h, which is equal to cos squared of h minus one minus cos squared of h, which is two cosine squared of h, and then minus the number one. So we have something like that. But let's see, putting that in, in the place of cosine of 2h will cancel this one right here and leave us with something that's pretty nice, I think. So let's bring that down. So we'll have sine of x and then we'll have the limit as h goes to zero of, now it will be two times cosine of h minus one all over h squared. And then this is another kind of well-known limit, maybe not as well-known as the others, but the value of this is minus one half. But that'll cancel with this two, along with the fact that cosine of zero is one, giving us a minus one for this entire limit, meaning that we get minus sine of x, but that's expected because that's the second derivative of sine. I'm gonna finish this off with a formula for higher derivatives. So we have the nth derivative of f is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of one over h to the n, and then the sum as k goes from zero to n of minus one to the k plus n, we have n choose k, f evaluated at x plus kh. Okay, so let's maybe look at the n equals one case of this. So the n equals one case, we'll have the first derivative is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of one over h, and then we'll have the sum from k equals zero to k equals one. So the k equals zero term will give us negative one to the zero plus one, so that's negative one. n choose k, so that'll be, let's see, one choose zero, which is one, and then we'll have f of x plus zero times h. So we'll have negative f of x, and then the k equals one term will give us plus f of x plus h. So that's exactly the limit definition of the first derivative. And then I'll let you check that we get similarly f double prime is what we had previously on the board. Now what I'd like to do from here is maybe prove the inductive step that this formula holds. And it's like a little bit of a loose proof. So we'll use the limit definition for the first derivative applied to the nth derivative here. So that'll be the limit as h1 tends towards zero of the nth derivative evaluated at x plus h1 minus the nth derivative evaluated at x all over h1. Okay, but now applying this formula over here will give us something kind of nice to work with. We'll have the limit as h1 goes to zero the limit as h goes to zero of one over h1 times h to the n. And then we'll have the sum as k goes from zero up to n of, let's see, minus one to the k plus n. And then we'll have n choose k. And then we'll have f evaluated at x plus kh plus h1 for this term right here, and then minus f evaluated at x plus kh for this term right here. Okay, so that's a bit of a monster, but we'll kind of put it all together from here. So I'm gonna smash these two limits together because they're both h type terms going to zero, which means I'll replace all my h1s with h, and this is where it's a little bit sketchy. Furthermore, I'll pull these sums apart. So that'll leave me with the limit as h goes to zero of one over h to the n plus one times, so the sum as k goes from zero up to n of minus one to the k plus n, n choose k, f of x plus k plus one times h. That's what we get if we replace h one with h. Then we'll have a similar sum for the other bit. So this will be minus the sum as k goes from zero up to n of minus one to the k plus n, n choose k, f of x plus kh. Good. So we're left with something like this. And now we're gonna do a little bit of re-indexing. 
So let's re-index this term by sending k to k minus one. So that means we'll start at k equals one and we'll end at n plus one. Furthermore, here we'll have k minus one plus n, but that's gonna be the same thing as k plus n plus one, because negative one to the one and negative one to the negative one are the same. And then here we'll have a k minus one, and here we'll simply have k times h. So we're left with something like this. So now let's see what that does for us. We'll have the limit as h goes to zero of one over h to the n plus one, and then the sum as k goes from zero up to n plus one. I'm gonna put these two together, just keeping in mind that if I have n choose negative one, which is the k equals zero case right here, I get zero, so that doesn't really do anything. And then I'll also distribute this minus sign through, maybe make it a plus, and then I'll have an n plus one there. So let's see, I have minus one to the k plus n plus one, and then I have n choose k minus one plus n choose k, and all of that is multiplied into f of x plus kh. Nice. But now we can apply a binomial coefficient identity to this guy right here, and that simplifies down to n plus one choose k. But that achieves the n plus one version of this formula. So that's a sketch of the inductive argument to show that this always holds. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.